Welcome to Money Metals Midweek Memo, news and commentary relating to sound money, the precious metals markets, and the economy. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. So, you know how sometimes you're driving along the interstate and you get really, really sleepy? You know, you're doing the whole head bob thing, and then all of a sudden, you find yourself swerving off the road, and you hit those rumble strips. Wakes you up, right? You get this huge surge of adrenaline, and you think, man, I just about died. And then for a while, you're wide awake. You're attentive to every single detail. You know, you're you're playing it out in your head and you're thinking, I got to really pay attention because I I don't want to kill myself here. This is a dangerous situation. And then you start to get kind of sleepy again. And then you start to just kind of forget about it. And it's almost like you weren't in any danger at all. I think the stock market just played out this kind of scenario on Monday. Investors swerved, they hit the rumble strips, total freak out. But then by Friday, it was like, eh, no biggie, everything is fine. Is it though? I guess the question is, was this just an overreaction or was it a premonition? So what exactly happened? Well, we had one of the biggest stock market meltdowns in quite some time. A lot of people, as it was going down, were talking about it being similar to 1987. And it was was pretty pretty bloody out there. The carnage uh, was widespread. And I'll just give you some of the numbers. The Dow Jones was down 1,000. 33.99 33.99 points. That was 2.6%. That was actually uh, the smallest percentage drop. NASDAQ down 576 uh, points. That was 3.43%. S&P 500 lost 3%. And the Russell 2000 was down 3.33%. Now, of course, the sell-off wasn't limited to the U.S. markets. In fact, it started overseas. Uh, If you look at the totals around the globe, some $6.4 trillion was just wiped off of the global stock markets. Uh, For instance, Japan's Nikkei index, it was down 13.2% as investors absorbed Uh, the recent rate hike news over there in Japan. So it really just goes to show how quickly market sentiment can shift, right? Now, there were a couple of things that happened last week that were kind of catalysts for this big sell-off. First, the Bank of Japan increased its key interest rate to around 0.25%, which Obviously, still ridiculously low, but um, and that's coming off the previous range of zero. Um, and you know that might not sound like a big deal, but get this: it was only the second interest rate hike by the Bank of Japan since get this, 2007. The central bank rate has basically been negative in Japan for like 15 years. So this rate hike gave the yen a big boost, and that created a problem. Now, this is kind of interesting from a broader economics perspective. I talk a lot about how central bank monetary policy and really government policies, more broadly speaking, they create malinvestments. So really, it's about incentives, right? When policymakers intervene in the market, it creates incentives to do certain things. Now, of course, some of the incentives that are created are on purpose. For instance, low interest rates are meant to incentivize borrowing in order to stimulate economic activity. It's the whole point. It's monetary stimulus. Now, of course, there's a dark side to this incentive, and that's the massive debt bubbles that blow up. And, you know, we have one of those here right now in the United States. That's why everybody is so freaked out about the Fed continuing to hold interest rates at 5.5%. I'm going to get into that a little bit deeper here in just a minute. But there are also a number of unintended incentives. So Japan's absurd interest rate policy incentivized a huge number of carry trades. 
So what's a carry trade? Well, this is a financial strategy where an investor borrows money at a low interest rate in one currency, so in this case, the yen, with the 0% interest rates, and it invests that money in uh, a different currency that provides a higher return or interest rate. So the goal basically is to profit from the difference between the borrowing cost and the investment return. The investor takes the borrowed yen and converts them into currency of a country with a higher interest rate and a stronger currency, so let's say the U.S. dollar. Then they invest the dollars into dollar-denominated assets. So they turn the yen into dollars and invest in, say, U.S. stocks or U.S. treasuries. The investor then earns interest returns on the higher-yielding investment profiting on the difference between the higher returns and the lower borrowing costs. So it's really a way to maximize your borrowing power, right? You're, you're getting a cheap interest rate, and then you're converting that currency and using it uh, to take advantage of higher interest rates in another economy. So this is cute, works great, until the currency you borrowed suddenly gains strength. So if you've done a carry trade and you've borrowed in yen and you've changed them into dollars, if the yen strengthens significantly against the borrowed currency, those profits that you're earning can quickly transform, transform into losses. So this is exactly what happened. With rates a little bit higher in Japan, a lot of investors wanted to unwind those carry trades before the losses started to mount. So traders scrambled to sell higher risk dollar denominated assets to cover suddenly higher borrowing costs due to the appreciation of the yen. And this was compounded as the stock market began to sell off by losses in asset values as share prices plunged. So that was part of the equation. We had this going on overseas overnight, started in Japan, then it moved into Europe and and then, of course, when the markets opened here in the United States on Monday, the carnage continued. But that was just one part of the equation. There was also some news that came out on Friday here in the U.S. that spooked investors, and that was the lousy July jobs report that came out on Friday. As it turns out, according to the BLS numbers, the economy only created 114,000 jobs uh, in, June, uh, in July. And the expectation was for 175,000 jobs. So it was a huge miss. And on top of that, the unemployment rate jumped to 4.3%. And the expectation was for an unemployment rate of 3.1%. On top of that, they actually revised down the June numbers. Shock of all shocks, right? It, it seems like, uh, you know, it seems like they always revise them down. And I've talked about that on the show before. But so all of that was really bad news. And it created to panic, right? Everybody decided all of a sudden that there was a recession risk. You know, it's like somebody shined a light in the crawl space under the house and discovered the foundation of this economy was starting to rot. You know, and so they fretted that the Federal Reserve waited too long to cut interest rates, and they worried that the Fed's lollygagging would tip the economy into a recession. So it created this, this panic. Now, if you've been listening to this show, you know I've been talking about the issues with this debt riddled bubble economy for months. And I've been saying that while rates still aren't high enough to kill the inflation dragon, they're certainly high enough to pop the bubbles and break things in this economy. And it's kind of funny. I mean, it's not funny because, you know, a lot of money was lost on Monday, but it's funny in the sense that it's amazing how fast everybody went from being absolutely certain that we were on the path to a soft landing to now we're bracing for a crash landing. It's like, boom, in the twinkle of an eye, the, the entire sentiment changed. And it's like, all of a sudden, people realized what I've been talking about for quite a while. I mean, it's almost, I mean... I really don't like to I told you so because I recognize that I can be wrong. It's really, really hard not to start saying I told you so. Anyway, for a second, it was kind of this light bulb moment. And I thought this bit of analysis from Bloomberg was really telling. It really 
it really kind of reveals the underbelly of the markets. Quote, one thing is clear. The pillars that had underpinned financial market gains for years, a series of key assumptions that investors across the world were banking on, have been shaken. They look, in hindsight, a bit naive, because nobody's paying attention to the fundamentals. That's my uh, editorial interjection. But the U.S., and these are the, uh, here are the naive assumptions that have been made. The U.S. economy is unstoppable. Artificial intelligence will quickly revolutionize business everywhere. And Japan will never hike interest rates, or not enough to really matter. And all of these kind of assumptions have been shaken over the last couple of weeks. Now, again, if you're really paying attention to the fundamentals, if you understand the dynamics of the business cycle, if you understand how monetary policy and government policy impact economies, none of this is a bit surprising. But market analysts, most of them don't have any clue about any of this. And Quite honestly, I think a lot of it out there in the marketplace is just follow the leader. So everybody freaked out because, again, it was like, you know, you, you pull back the rug and there's a bunch of roaches scurrying around. You're like, ah! So, you know, I, I talked about this last week, actually, how so many people now think these crazy policies that were put in place after the 2008 financial crisis are normal. You know, they think that 0% interest rates are normal. You know, they, again, they think Japan will never hike interest rates. And they think the stock market will always go up. And they assume that the Fed will always intervene if there is a problem. And I think that's kind of, you know, I, I think that's kind of what this temper tantrum in the markets was. The Fed had a meeting and they certainly signaled a, a rate cut coming up in September, but they didn't do it. And I think a lot of people wanted them to do it. And so this was a little bit of pent up frustration about that, right? Because they just assume that the Fed is going to ride in on the white horse and, and protect the markets. And, and the Fed didn't do it. In fact, if you listen to, to, to some of the Fed people, uh, during and after the stock market meltdown, they were like, oh, no, everything's fine. The economy's fine. And I think a lot of people are buying that. But anyway, check out the episode last week if you missed it, because I go deep into the weeds about why the interest rate environment since 2008 is the abnormality, right? That's abnormal. What we have today is actually closer to normal than, uh, than what we've had over most of the last decade, almost two. So anyway, we had this big sell-off, and then on Tuesday, everything kind of went back to normal, right? Uh, the stock markets regained a lot of the losses. Uh, the Nikkei, it gained back almost all of its losses, and, and uh, everything was fine. It was like the adrenaline surge from hitting the rumble strips wore off, and you know everything's fine. No problem. I did not almost die, right? And yet, the economy is still loaded up with debt, all of the malinvestments incentivized after 2008 and then doubled down on during the pandemic are still out there. The economy is still addicted to easy money, i.e. inflation. The Fed is still between a rock and a hard place, between a, uh, a looming bust and red-hot inflation. Everything is still in place for the inevitable bust. It's a boom bust cycle. We've enjoyed the boom, but the bust is always commensurate with the boom. So it appears this probably wasn't it. I mean, it's hard to say because, you know, as, as I said on Tuesday, everything seemed to be back to normal, but there's so much volatility out there. One little, you know, swerve one way or the other, or one little bit of bad data or, you know, all hell breaking loose in the Middle East, anything could start toppling this Jenga tower. But as I'm sitting here recording this, everything seems, yeah, okay, we're all right. This wasn't the big one, right? But I would be wary of getting all cocky and buying into the everything is fine narrative that still prevails out there in the mainstream. I've been saying that we are, we're about mid-2007 in the cycle right now. And honestly, when, when the stock market started tanking on Monday, I was a little surprised because I didn't expect things to unravel 
at this point. I don't think we're there yet. And it's really interesting. I keep going back to this, this comparison between pre-2008 and where we are today. And there's so many parallels uh, in terms of the yield curve, in terms of uh, the, the trajectory of interest rates. Remember, the Fed started cutting interest rates in late 2007, almost a year before we had the inevitable 2008 financial crisis. So, Always keep that in mind. It takes a while for this stuff to play out. Now, as we kind of watched this uh, this mini crisis unwind on Monday, a lot of people have been asking me, why did gold and silver both sell off along with stocks? Right? Gold is supposed, uh, supposedly a safe haven, right? Shouldn't a good haven do well amidst market chaos? Now, in fact, the plunge in the gold price was perfectly normal given the market condition. Gold often sells off early in a bear market for stocks. And, I mean, it certainly sold off uh, on Monday. At its low, the price of gold on Monday was down 3.2%. And that was early in the day before rallying later to recover the $2,400 an ounce level. Nevertheless, the yellow metal finished down 1.3% on the day on Monday. And then even as stocks rallied on Tuesday, we had still a lot of pressure on gold because what happens? What happened was stocks, uh, they kind of uh, regained some of their mojo. The dollar strengthened. Uh, bond yields started going up again. So people were selling bonds. So Gold has gotten hammered a little bit, and silver got pounded even harder. It dropped by as much as 7.2% uh, at its intraday low on Monday. And you can kind of explain silver's big drop because worries were centered around an economic slowdown, and an ensuing decrease in silver demand kind of hammered the silver price down even further than gold. But as I said, none of this is surprising at all if you followed the gold market for a while. Because, again, gold typically sells off in the early stages of a big stock market sell-off. I'll give you one example. In 2020, gold had a 3% decline multiple times in the early days of the pandemic sell-off in stocks. In October 2008, gold plunged by more than 7% in the early days of the financial crisis. So why? Why does a safe haven sell off when you're having a panic in the markets? Precisely because gold serves as a hedge. So what happens is investors often hold gold as a hedge, and then they liquidate winning gold positions during a sharp downturn in order to cover their stock losses. But if you look at the history and the trajectory, gold generally falls less sharply and recovers more quickly than the stock market. And that's exactly the scenario that played out in miniature on Monday. Here's how an analyst explained all of this uh, to Bloomberg. Quote, virtually every time there is a marked equities weakness, investors who hold gold as a risk hedge will liquidate part of their holdings to raise liquidity against any potential margin calls. When the dust settles, they almost invariably buy it back. Now, margin calls are a big problem for investors during a sharp, fast stock market downturn. When an account a brokerage account, when it falls below a certain threshold, brokers will often demand additional deposits of money or securities to bring the account balance back up to a required minimum level. So given gold's liquidity, investors can quickly sell it to raise the cash necessary to cover margin calls or even just to have it on standby in case there are margin calls that come down the pipe. So it's really important to put Monday's gold sell-off into perspective. Even with the downturn, gold hit a record just a few weeks ago, right? And the yellow metal is still up well over 15% on the years, with most of the bullish factors still firmly in place. So don't panic when you see these single-day sell-offs in gold. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, all of a sudden a, a bear market. And I guess you could say the same for stocks, right? Because uh, there were a lot of people panicking on Monday, and now I guess everything's fine. But a 
recession, and kind of going back to these bullish factors for gold, a recession would likely mean deeper and quicker interest rate cuts by the Fed, right? I mentioned this earlier. The central bank typically rides in on a white horse and rescues the economy. We saw it during the pandemic. The Fed ran in. It just instantly put interest rates at zero, and it immediately started doing quantitative easing, which is basically money printing. It injected nearly $5 trillion into the economy. This is the fork the Fed knows. This is what it does. When there's a crisis, it goes into stimulus mo mode. Now, don't ever forget that stimulus mode means inflation, as we saw uh, in the uh, wake of the whole pandemic thing. But anyway, so... A recession would mean deeper and quicker interest rate cuts. And, and I think this is the scenario that's going to play out, right? We'll probably get an interest rate cut uh, in September. I'm still inclined to think it's probably eh, maybe the, uh, the, the uh, 25% or the 25 basis point cut, but there are increasingly uh, a lot of people are thinking, oh, we might get a whole half a percentage point cut. We'll, we'll have to see. We'll see what comes in September. There are even some people that are kind of hoping that the Fed will see this carnage in the stock market and uh, you know do an emergency meeting to do a rate cut. I don't think that's going to happen based on what I've heard from some of the Fed officials. But regardless, we're going to get those rate cuts in September. So as I talked about last week, the Fed is set to surrender to inflation already. But when the economy really does crash, right? When we really recognize that we're in a recession, when something breaks in the financial system, that's when we're really going to get the rate cuts. Uh, in other words, we're really going to get some serious uh, and, and hardcore inflation. So, you know, what, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here is the inflation dragon is likely to be resurrected if you actually believe he's dead to begin with. So, um, as far as silver, I, I think there's still reasons to be bullish on silver, even with the possibility of an economic downturn. Now, a recession would certainly temper industrial demand for silver, and the white metal is always more volatile than gold. But, Silver is fundamentally a monetary metal, and it does tend to track with gold over time. In fact, I've said this often on the show, silver has historically outperformed gold in a bull market. For example, during the pandemic, we had a big increase in gold, about 40%. Meanwhile, silver was up 141%. Now, it gave up those gains faster, but we can see this, this kind of dynamic that when you get this really strong bull market, uh, inflation-driven, Fed-driven bull market in gold, silver tends to follow along. So, you know, whether Monday's sell-off was just a tremor before an earthquake or if it was the beginning of the great unwind, because, I mean, it still could be, right? We often see uh, dead cat bounces in the midst of a stock market sell-off. Regardless whether this is just a, a kind of an anomaly or it is the beginning of the, of the unwind, there are plenty of reasons to be bullish on both gold and silver. I want to take a little time to expound on something that I alluded to a few minutes ago. I mentioned the fact that interest rates at 5.5% today are actually closer to normal than the 0% interest rates that we had for nearly a decade after the 2008 financial crisis. And yet, we have a lot of people in the mainstream who are screaming for the Fed to normalize interest rates. In fact, I ran across a uh, CNBC article last week, and they were extensively quoting this analyst who was pushing to normalize interest rates. And I'm like, they're kind of normal now. So to explain this, I'm going to use an analogy, and I've used it before. I often compare the Fed to a drug pusher supplying the economy with monetary heroin. So a drug addict constantly needs more and more of a drug to get the same effect, right? It's resistance. So the U.S. economy is addicted to easy money, and it needs more and more easy money, the easy money drug, to maintain the high. Now, the problem with this scenario is eventually the drug addict can overdose. So if you go back and you think about the trajectory of interest rates over the last 20 years or so, in the wake of the financial crisis, the Federal Reserve slashed interest rates to zero. 
This was an unprecedented move, and it was justified because it was an unprecedented emergency. Now, little did anybody know that this emergency would last seven years. That's right. The Fed did not move rates off zero until December of 2015. And even then, it was just a quarter percent interest rate hike. After that, it waited a full year before it hiked again. So in, a, in effect, it was eight years of almost 0% interest rates. So the central bank finally started hiking rates in earnest in 2017. And it pushed rates to 2.5% by December 2018. This is 10 years after the financial crisis, right? And we've only got interest rates back to 2.5%. They peaked at 5.25% before the uh, Great Recession, if I remember correctly. So that 2.5% in 2018, that was the end of normalizing interest rates. But this was nowhere near normal because during the cycle prior to the Great Recession, again, the rates peaked at 5.25%. That was in June 2016. So in the fall of 2018, with his drug supply kind of cut off, the addict threw a fit. The fit looked a little bit like what we saw on Monday. He wanted his easy money drug back. The stock market crashed. The economy started showing signs of recession. And to avoid the pain of withdrawal, the pusher, the Fed, started supplying the easy money drug again. It cut rates three times in 2019, and it abandoned balance sheet reduction. How familiar does this actually sound? It's almost like we're on a repeat of 2018. So then came COVID-19, and the pandemic gave the Fed the excuse that it needed to fill the easy money syringe all the way to the top and shove that plunger down. Rates went instantly back to zero until price inflation inevitably reared its ugly head. So this little rate history lesson illustrates a point. The economy needs more and more easy money every single cycle. It's the resistance effect, right? The threshold for normal gets lower and lower, meaning more and more of the easy money drug is needed. That's why everybody is clamoring for rate cuts today. The addict is on the verge of withdrawal. He wants his drug supply to go back to normal, the new normal, which basically is zero. Now, really, when you get down to it, it's difficult to define what normal is when it comes to interest rates, right? Because they move constantly. But you have to remember that interest rates are a price. It's the price of borrowing money, the cost of money. So in a sane world, the market would set interest rates in the same way that it sets the price of cell phones or milk, right? The market would sort it out through the activity of millions and millions of people. But we don't live in a sane world. We live in a world where central planners try to set rates. And if we just allowed the market to function, we would know exactly what normal meant. It would be the rate that the market set. But even with all of this interference, we can kind of look at averages and Historically, the average federal funds rate since 1970 has been 4.95%. So that's basically where we are today. We're about half a percentage point above that. So from a historical perspective, this is normal, or if you want to be really pedantic, you can say it's slightly above normal. And yet, uh, this, this woman who was, was barking on CNBC and many others are pleading for the Fed to start normalizing rates. And here's the, the wild thing. If you factor out the nearly 15 years of artificially low rates in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, you discover that rates today are actually a little below normal. The average federal funds rate from 1970 to 2007, before we had the unprecedented rate cuts, was 6.74%. So if you actually look at a chart of the Federal Reserve funds rate over time, it's clear what's happening. And I'll actually post this chart on the show notes page if folks want to go over to moneymetals.com slash news and look at it. Every single hype, uh, cycle, every single business cycle, every single boom-bust cycle, the Fed's 
delivers more and more easy money drug to fuel the boom. And then once we have the ensuing bust and that passes, the peak interest rate in the next cycle ratchets lower and lower. So if you look at a graph of the trajectory of interest rates, it stair steps down. So as the addict builds up resistance to the drug, it needs more and more to maintain the high and it can tolerate less and less of a taper when the party gets out of control. This is an example of what economist Robert Higgs termed the ratchet effect. Higgs argued that during times of a national emergency, like an unprecedented financial crisis, um, also, he, he was talking more in terms of war, but also severe economic downturns, governments expand their authority and intervention into the economy. And they often justify this with, you know, we have to address this, the crisis. It's an emergency. You heard it over and over again during the pandemic. Now, after the crisis passes, the government usually eases intervention eventually, right? Started hiking rates again after the 2008 financial crisis, not until 2015, but it did finally do that. But it never returns to the normal before the emergency. The overall size and scope of government remains larger than before the crisis. Or in the case of our uh, scenario, interest rates end up lower than before the crisis. So this ratchet effect leads to a long-term trend of increasing government intervention over time as each crisis creates a new baseline for government intervention that's higher than before. So, this Fed interest rate policy, as I just said, it shows a negative ratchet effect. After each crisis, the baseline for normal interest rates gets lower and lower. The problem with upping the dosage of drugs to maintain a high is that eventually the addict overdoses. I said this already, right? But I want to hammer that point home. This is where we're heading. So the question becomes, how much more easy money can the Fed inject before the economy overdoses. Now, in the past, the Fed has expressed a reluctance to do what Japan did and toy with negative interest rates. Instead, it has used the balance sheet to inject easy money drugs into the system. And as I mentioned in last week's show, the Fed pumped nearly $4 trillion into the economy during the Great Recession through quantitative easing, and it upped the ante to nearly $5 trillion in quantitative easing um, during the pandemic. And it did it in a much shorter time span. So what happens when we have the next crisis? Are we going to have $8 trillion in QE? $20 trillion? The question becomes, when does the drug kill the addict? When does it get to be too much? When do we have the overdose? And I think we're getting close to that point, to be honest. Now, the Fed always manages to surprise me with this ability to take things farther than you would think that they that they could. But it is just a matter of time, right? You know, some people you can inject a bunch of drug before they start to overdose, but eventually they will overdose. Eventually the economy will crack under the weight of this monetary drug. And what we're talking about when we talk about an overdose is we start to talk about inflation. We start to talk about rapid, uh, aggressive price increases. We experienced this in, in a small way after the pandemic. But when it finally does overdose, we're going to see a massive uh, increase in consumer prices. And it could, worst case scenario, even cross the threshold into hyperinflation. The only way to avoid it is to stop supplying the drug. But that hurts too, right? Going through withdrawal hurts. It's good pain if you go through it and then you're not addicted anymore. But politicians and central bankers are not generally willing to inflict pain because They'll find themselves without a job, right? People get angry and, and they boot them out of office. So the incentive is to just keep the party going, keep injecting the drug, uh, you know, and, and when we get the inevitable price inflation, we'll just blame Putin's price hikes or greedy corporations. So the Fed is stuck between a rock and a hard place. I've said this over and over again. And here's the options. This is the, this is the scenario. There's two ways this can go. The Fed can ramp up the party and risk an overdose in the form of more rampant price inflation, or again, worst case scenario, Zimbabwe-style hyperinflation, or it can hold back the drugs and risk the painful withdrawal. 
Either way, our addict has a big problem. And unfortunately, that means we have a big problem because we're going to either be confronted with more and more price inflation, dealing with what we've dealt with over the last couple of years and getting worse, or we're going to have to deal with a deep, painful economic downturn. The preferable thing, in my view, would be the economic downturn. Get the malinvestments out of the economy. Let the debt bubbles burst. Let everything sort itself out and then start over again. But I don't think there's the political will for that to happen. I think the more likely scenario is for the Fed to rush in with the drug and try to get the party started again to start injecting the easy money. So when we do have a real crash, we will see rates go back to zero. We may even see the Fed tinker with negative interest rates if it gets bad enough. Certainly more quantitative easing, probably more quantitative easing than we had during the pandemic, which again, all inflationary. So these are the two scenarios. You can kind of pick your poison, but I guess for now we can just all pretend that everything is fine. Um, not wise, but I think that's what most people are going to do. The good thing is these sell-offs in gold and silver present nice buying opportunities, right? I've been talking about this for several weeks. You want to have your safe haven, your hedge in place, before there's a crisis. You want to have your inflation hedge set up before you get massive price inflation. So you, you don't want to be out there trying to buy your hurricane insurance or your flood insurance uh, when the storm's approaching because they won't give it to you. And you can get gold and silver, but you're going to pay a lot more for it. So the dips are a good time to buy. Now is a great time to call 800-800-1865 and talk to a money metals, precious metals specialist. They can help you figure out how gold and silver will fit into your investment strategy. They'll help you figure out the best products for, uh, for your purposes. And these, these folks are fantastic. Utilize the knowledge that they have. Talk to them today. Now, I know a lot of people aren't big on talking on the phone, so you don't have to. You can just go to moneymetals.com and chat with the precious metal specialist right there online. Or if you know what you want, you know, you, you want silver eagles or gold bars, you can buy directly from our website. But whatever you choose to do, whether you call 800-800-1865 or you just go online, don't wait. Do it today. Take advantage of the dips and, uh, you know, don't wait to get your insurance uh, after the crisis has already started. So with that, it is a wrap for this episode of the Money Metals Midweek Memo. You can get more information about everything that I've talked about on the show today and more over at moneymetals.com slash news. And if you want to get the latest news and information relating to gold and silver right in your inbox, sign up, get on our email list. Now, of course, if you haven't done it already, you can subscribe to the Midweek Memo on your favorite podcasting platform. And you can also, on that same subscription, tune in to our Market Wrap podcast every Friday. You get a quick overview of the week in precious metals, along with interesting conversations between yours truly and people from the world of gold, silver, economics, and investing. As I say every week, I really do appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to listen to the show. I know there are a lot of things to listen to out there, a lot of things you can do with your time. It means a lot to me that you spend a little bit of it uh, listening to me. So thank you so much for that. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week, and we'll be right back here again next Wednesday. 